Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Craig Marin. I'm an assistant professor at Maritime Studies, Sea Education Association, um, and uh, this is uh, this is one of our uh, this is a class from the quarter deck uh, in a series of uh, virtual faculty lectures, uh, and there will be another one uh, on this coming Tuesday um, by Dr. Jeff Schell. Um, so uh, a couple of things as we get going here. Um, one is, uh, uh, I think you've all heard me say now that uh, I've got an, a waiting room, an active waiting room. Um, so if I sort of pause in the middle of things, there you see my mouse madly moving around. Um, please just be patient as I'm uh, letting folks in. Uh, the other thing is uh, particularly for those of you, uh, and there are several of you in the audience who have my contact information, um, feel free to uh, shoot me uh, a text or something as, as we go along if either the audio becomes an issue um, or uh, something starts to go wrong with the video uh, just so that I'm not talking to um, just my computer screen but hopefully talking to all the people beyond the computer screen. Um, that would be great. Um, okay, so uh, let's get started here. Um, so this uh, this presentation, um, I'm, sorry, I'm not going to call it a lecture. This presentation uh, is designed to do two things. Um, one, it is to deal with one of the issues that, uh, as a, a, an instructor for SEA now, uh, assistant professor for uh, just over seven years, uh, is one of the things that I have consistently come back to, which is uh, the connection between uh, the development of the sugar plantation complex. Uh, and the uh, current issues that uh, island nations face throughout the Caribbean, um, particularly as it relates to climate change, um, and uh, and dealing with uh, you know the impact, uh, and this is sort of what we're emphasizing in our our opening images here, um, our sugar plantation from uh, an illustration from 1823, uh, showing uh, workers in the cane fields. Uh, on the left and then on the right, we have uh, the devastation of uh, Hurricane Maria in 2017 in Dominica. Um, so this is something that uh, I often emphasize in, uh, in my classes as I teach. And so part of what I want to do today is just sort of uh, give this uh, more as a, this is how we, we sort of talk about and approach uh, these topics in uh, the program that takes us down to the Caribbean most consistently. Uh, so as I move along, you'll hear me refer back to um, uh, a number of times this uh, this program, which is colonization and conservation in the Caribbean. Um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll say the full name uh, uh, a number of times, and then I'll start reverting back to uh, CCC, which is uh, much easier to uh, to roll off the tongue. Um, so anyway, uh, this is uh, sort of a uh, a way to kind of get a picture of the of this program, um, and then one of the uh, the themes that uh, we often talk about. Um, it is by no means comprehensive uh, in covering what we're talking about, um, but it is to give a taste and hopefully to raise some questions um, that I am happy to answer when we uh, when we get to the end. So uh, my goal is to to get through these in as timely fashion as possible. Uh, the slides I have. Um, but to leave some um, some blanks, if you will, um, and uh, happy to fill those in as we move forward. So, where are we? Um, so we begin with, um, and no, this is not my artwork. This is artwork from one of our uh, our students. Um, and uh, despite the fact that I think I've attached names to the other artwork, I think I forgot to attach a name to this one. Uh, Colonization and Conservation in the Caribbean is a program um, that the CSMS has been running for a number of years. I've been teaching it in the seven uh, years that I've been working for SEA with my colleague, Jeff Schell, um, last iteration uh, with um, my other colleagues, uh, Captain Allison Taylor uh, and our teaching fellow, Maria Jose Fernandez. Um, and so this is, uh, one of the uh, the programs that I've taught from year to year, um, and uh, it certainly qualifies as uh, as one of my favorite um, programs to teach. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how it's organized, um, and 
and what some of the things are that we do in this program. So um, like all C semesters, there are, there are three core courses. Uh, there's nautical science, uh, there's oceanography, and then there's maritime studies. Um, but what uh, colonization and conservation in the Caribbean does is to take those um, subjects and where there is overlap, um, where we can teach these in a uh, multidisciplinary fashion, uh, we do so. So that we've uh, a couple of built-in courses that do that, uh, maritime history and culture, um, which I co-teach uh, with the captain, in this case, Allison Taylor, uh, and then marine environmental history, which I co-teach with uh, the oceanographer, the chief scientist, Jeff Shell. Um, in this case, um, in all cases so far with CCC. Um, but uh, the image that I have up here now uh, indicates sort of how we begin uh, each day uh, during the shore component uh, of CCC. Um, and that shore component um, is uh, six weeks uh, in preparation for um, then six weeks on board uh, the Corps with Kramer, 134, uh, 34 foot brigantine. Um, and so what we're doing in the shore component is, yeah, we're preparing the students to board the ship uh, at the end of, this, uh, of the shore component, uh, at the end of that six weeks. Um, but we're also trying to prepare them for um, you know, a, a trip to the Caribbean um, and to uh, run the gamut of topics that, uh, that we cover. What I want to focus on in, in this particular class, um, or, sorry, in this particular presentation, uh, is the MEH portion, that marine environmental history portion. Um, and actually, this is a, an excellent picture to use because the presentation is happening here. Every hour begins with student presentations. So you two, sometimes three students will present based on a document, based on a historic voyage account. Um, or uh, in this group session, we're actually uh, looking at uh, and analyzing um, the, uh, the phenomena that you can pull out of a, a pilot chart. Uh, and so we're looking at ocean currents, we're, we're looking at, um, uh, uh, at uh, sea surface temperature, uh, we're looking at um, predominant winds, uh, all of this to sort of contextualize the, um, the ways in which Europeans will interact with, uh, with the Caribbean uh, and bring them in, but also understand uh, a little bit about the, the nature of that environment, the climate. Um, that, uh, that the Caribbean holds and it becomes one of the important factors in understanding the development of uh, the sugar plantation complex. Um, so I would say uh, at this point that uh, the program is really um, trying to bring in, in this uh, hour long session every morning, uh, we are bringing all the disciplines uh, into play here um, and we are not uh, sort of neatly uh, dividing them up into different areas. So um, you know, bringing in what you remember from uh, a um, maritime uh, studies class uh, with me, where I did a particular reading as it relates to uh, an oceanography-focused project. Um, you know, that's that's the kind of thing that we do, and we use our um, we allow the students to become uh, the primary teachers for some of these um, sort of I call it cross-pollination moments, uh, where they have an aha moment and they share that with the with the rest of the group. Um, and from this, uh, we all students and faculty alike um, learn more and more about uh, the Caribbean as, uh, as these programs go on year after year. Certainly um, the faculty, I have learned uh, an enormous amount uh, from the students. And so we try to empower the students as, uh, as much as we can. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is with this um, power hour session in the morning. Uh, we also take advantage of our resources in the region. Um, so this is an image of a visit to the um, Marine Biological Laboratories Library. Uh, with Jen Walton uh, showing off some of the things that are in their rare books collection, um, specifically looking at Lucart charts here. Um, but we introduce students to the, uh, the ways in which uh, people have, over a long period of time, uh, approached voyaging and approached uh, interacting with the sea. Uh, and you know, this becomes uh, one of the ways in which we, we try to inspire them to, uh, to figure out how they want to uh, approach this, this process. Um, one of the other things that we um, do is in sort of preparing students um, uh, for the, the work ahead and, uh, and for understanding, <laughs> um, and my participant list is covering up this slide, so I'm to think for a second about which one it was. Uh, 
we introduced uh, students uh, to documents in a variety of places, um, and I referenced in our Power Hour that we use documents as a sort of springboard, if you will, um, for student projects. Uh, a lot of those documents, and you'll see them later in, uh, in this presentation, come from the John Carter Brown Library. Uh, the John Carter Brown Library is, uh, is uh, a part of Brown University campus, and they've worked their way into the library system of their separate institution. Um, and so from the inception of, uh, of this program, uh, there's been a strong connection to the John Carter Brown Library and the documents that students choose from um, with their projects. Uh, many of them are drawn from there. So we will eventually uh, go to Providence and visit the John Carter Brown Library and some of the documents that students have been working for uh, with, they can get uh, a first hand right up close um, look at them. Um, and then one of the, uh, the things that we encourage them to do, looking to inspire them, uh, is, is the ways in which they observe um, the world and the way in which they record what they observe. Um, so you know, here we have an image of uh, uh, students working together um, along, uh, along those lines. We'll come back to that um, in a subsequent slide, but uh, part of our visit to Providence includes a visit to the Rhode Island School of Design's um, Nature Lab. Uh, and so you can see students practicing their uh, um, their skills in uh, recording observations. All right. So again, this is all part of what we do uh, in uh, in CCC. Uh, and this particular bit, all the images are from the Flash Board CC90. All right. So um, here we are in the Caribbean. Um, this is uh, an image uh, drawn from the John Carter Brown Library's collection. Uh, and, you know, what we're doing uh, is trying to give as, and this is a 1673 map uh, of the Caribbean, um, is to uh, allow students to enter in at various points in history. Um, we'll start out as early as we can. Uh, yes, we, we cover a little bit of, uh, of pre-contact um, history and understanding of, uh, of the, uh, the Native American population. Um, how they ended up peopling the islands, uh, what their interactions with each other were like, uh, and then of course what their interactions with Europeans were like. Um, but we do um, have to have a starting point somewhere. And, and as, a, as a historian uh, looking at written records, um, you know, 1492, the arrival of Columbus um, is uh, sort of a starting point that we, we use here. Um, so we're gonna be introducing our students to, um, uh, to the Caribbean in a variety of ways. Uh, and we've sort of run the gamut, and I'll come back to this in a moment um, as I will play the, the virtual bookshelf. There's no bookshelf behind me, um, so I have a little bit of, uh, of bookshelf envy uh, when I'm watching other people do, uh, do presentations or uh, in meetings. Um, but uh, in terms of the topic that we're covering today, um, you know, what are we covering here? What's the trajectory? Well, we're starting out with the earliest uh, cultivation of sugar. Um, which was done by uh, the Spanish conquistadores uh, as they came over Columbus on a second voyage, brought um, sugar plants with him from the Canary Islands. Uh, and with the idea that uh, despite the intense emphasis, um, and I would call it an obsession, uh, with silver and gold, um, there was a turn toward cultivation um, in uh, what they were then calling Hispaniola. Um, and some of the earliest cultivation happened right in, uh, in and around Santo Domingo. So, uh, and this is from um, an early uh, depiction, Theodore Debris, uh, 1595, uh, essentially noting that when the mineral wealth of Hispaniola was no longer easy to find, um, they began turning towards sugar production. Um, but then sugar production expands elsewhere. It leaves the Spanish-held uh, territories and islands uh, and moves out into the English and the Dutch and the French and the Danish. Um, islands, uh, and that sugar production becomes much more intense uh, as we move ahead in time. Um, sugar production is still happening uh, in the Caribbean. So while this is a story of the legacy of the, um, uh, of the plantation complex in certain islands, uh, it's important to note that sugar still has an important role to play throughout the Caribbean uh, in a modern fashion and, of course, in a far more industrial uh, fashion than what we'll uh, cover in this uh, quick Look, so um, turning to the places that uh, leave sugar behind, um, or perhaps have sugar leave them behind, depends on uh, uh, how you want to say it. 
uh, a turn towards other cash crops um, becomes part of the picture. So here we have uh, banana cultivation being depicted. Um, but we're going to end up um, kind of as the introductory slide indicated, we're going to end up back in Dominica um, in modern day uh, and talk about the ways in which um, Dominica can sort of represent uh, a, a reckoning with the, the legacy as it relates specifically to climate change. All right, um, so we'll come back to this. So illustration uh, is a pretty important part of, uh, of what we do in uh, colonization and conservation in the Caribbean. Uh, and it, you know, it's a tool for improving your observation skills. Um, it, you know, we go through mindfulness exercises, um, you know, but it's, it's a means for recording, um, you know, not just what you see, but kind of like what, what your experience is, what you feel, um, you know, what a moment represents to you. Uh, and so, you know, working with, uh, in the sort of bottom left hand image here, uh, working with Rick Jones uh, and Peter Stone as our uh, illustration and journaling instructors. Uh, we try to build up uh, a degree of comfort with journaling and illustration where students can adopt their own style um, and, uh, and use that as, uh, as I've sort of listed here as the way for recording moments and observations and feelings about um, particular aspects of uh, what will be uh, their voyage. Um, once they join uh, the Corbett Kramer in San Juan. Um, so uh, the illustration is, is an essential part of, uh, of what we do in CCC. Okay, uh, bookshelf moment. I told you it was coming. Um, so there are lots and lots of different uh, topics that we cover. Um, we introduce students to a variety uh, of ways to understand the Caribbean um, through a variety of lenses. Um, and so it can take you in all kinds of different directions and certainly understanding uh, the Caribbean, really putting the, uh, the sugar plantation complex into uh, appropriate context. Um, I will often remind students to use the sugar plantation complex uh, as a context for other uh, events and developments, uh, but there's, it's interrelated. And, and so while there's lots and lots that we can talk about um, and some of these things are represented in, uh, in the books um, that I've, I've chosen to put in this virtual bookshelf, if you will. Um, there's, there's so much more. And again, uh, as I mentioned when I began, if you have questions that you know, go beyond the sort of environmental impacts of the plantation complex, uh, I'm happy to, to take those at the end. Um, but these represent some of the books that not only I use to prepare um, for discussions uh, and, and lectures, but also what students end up using as resources uh, as they go through the program. Okay, um, so let's start talking about sugar and, uh, and what's happening with it. So origins, uh, New Guinea, um, working its way then from uh, that portion uh, of Asia uh, into the Mediterranean, uh, across the Mediterranean, uh, out to the Atlantic Islands. Um, Atlantic Islands would mean uh, Madeira, the Canary Islands. Um, sugar production, the introduction of sugar to, uh, to Europeans. Yeah, it's introduced, um, you know, it's often hard to conceive of this. It, it starts out more as a, as a spice for food, a condiment for food, um, rather, than, rather than an integral part of, uh, of regular diet. And so it's, uh, it's scarce, uh, it is valuable. And so uh, the colonial endeavors of both Portugal and Spain, uh, as they leave the Iberian Peninsula uh, and work their way out into uh, the Atlantic world and begin their voyaging um, and, uh, and sort of longer trade passages, uh, they'll take advantage of the uh, the island topography uh, in Madeira and the Canary Islands, uh, using the fact that you know these are um, fairly vertical islands uh, that you know produce those rain clouds and, and make that rain fall. Uh, they're nice and temperate. There's plenty of uh, of sun to go along with uh, the, with that periodic rain, and it turns out to be a pretty ideal environment uh, for uh, producing sugar. And so, with that in mind and that experience um, in mind. Uh, it's really no surprise that sugar is one of several uh, crops that Europeans will will turn to as uh, an option in uh, in the Americas and in the Caribbean. 
Um, so it's important to, to note uh, we won't be getting down there um, into uh, into Brazil, but the, the Portuguese is certainly producing lots of sugar and the, um, the process of producing it as it's introduced to other Europeans is not through the Spanish experience, but through the Portuguese experience. Um, so indirectly, uh, the English will eventually uh, learn and uh, begin to dominate uh, to a degree the sugar production uh, in the region. Okay, so um, what does this mean? How do we begin to wrap our heads around the, the concept of uh, plantation complex? So um, this is sort of to give you a, a sense of, uh, of what happens with the arrival of sugar um, and sugar production into, uh, into the Caribbean. So for the, the British, uh, the first place where sugar really takes off is in Barbados. Um, and one of the things to understand about sugar is that uh, while, yes, the, the climate uh, is an important factor in making it a, uh, the Caribbean and certain Caribbean islands in particular, there's good places to grow sugar, um, it still requires an enormous amount of labor. Uh, so when Europeans are first arriving in the Caribbean, they're seeing islands that are, um, that are heavily forested, um, that are not cleared or, you know, and you'll see descriptions and, and some of these will make them uh, make their way into print um, as, as almost promotional materials. Um, specifically, uh, you know, Richard Hackley uh, will promote um, the Americas as a place where you know, things grow easily. Um, and, uh, you know, all it takes is a, a little bit of effort and it's, it's untouched, um, unimproved, certainly from a British perspective. Um, land. Therefore, uh, it's land that, since it's unimproved, it isn't owned by anyone. Uh, and so the process of, uh, of moving in becomes really um, a one that is eased uh, uh, from the, uh, the perspective of, uh, of the English as they look around and refuse to acknowledge uh, the ways in which this land is already occupied. Um, actually, speci not specifically the case for Barbados, but for many of the other islands where the English will, um, will colonize. Um, the lack of any evidence that the, the land has been quote unquote improved um, makes it uh, not private property, therefore open uh, for others to claim. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to emphasize here is the, the intense labor. The, the British will start out with, um, and the Spanish will begin with, uh, with enslaving uh, the native population um, and then make a turn um, for a variety of reasons, um, but uh, you know, some of those are, are inspired by uh, qualms about the treatment of Native Americans and make a turn towards uh, the, the use of enslaved people from Africa. Um, by the time we get to the British uh, working their way into what was really Spanish territory, but the um, uh, Australians were not in a position to fully defend all the islands and are much more interested in what's going on in Central and South America, where they're finding that enormous uh, mineral wealth. Um, the Dutch, uh, the English, the French will come in uh, and, and make inroads. Um, but as they do so, they'll come in with their own ideas about labor uh, and how it should work. And so, as you can see from the, the table that's on the top of the slide, for like a 1629, um, you know, 97% 97, 97 of the population on the island um, was, uh, was of European descent, um, with only 3% uh, of African descent. As you move forward, uh, you start to see a significant shift in that. And what that represents is a, um, a shift in the labor system from indentured servants. Um, uh, and I think it's fair to, to argue that as this happens and you're turning towards the, uh, uh, the, uh, the purchase importation of enslaved Africans, that you're adding a racial element to labor um, that, you know, Straight up labor um, becomes associated with particular racial groups. Uh, and so you start to see a, a move away from indentured servitude um, and towards this embracing of chattel slavery, which is um, one of the, the ways in which we can understand how uh, the plantation complex develops. So highly labor intensive, uh, where that labor comes from will shift uh, towards uh, a, uh, a reliance on the, uh, on the slave trade from the west coast of Africa. But it's a high value commodity um, initially, but then we get a, a switch from that to as it's being produced, um, more and more is being produced and then values comes down and so there becomes sort of an economy of scale approach here. 
uh, where the people who are successful are the ones that have larger and larger land holdings. Um, and, uh, and that kind of, you know, the change, the change in the market breeds that change. Um, and I would argue that is what brings on a, um, even greater intensification uh, in production. So, um, how is it that, uh, that Barbados is being utilized? How is this land being changed? Um, so here's uh, an image that uh, comes from the John Carter Brown Library's collection. Um, and uh, my other computer, sorry, give me just a second. Making use of two computers here. Um, so I don't have to try to peer around uh, the uh, the chat and the participant list. Um, so, um, right, what we're looking for here, uh, we're looking at here is a 1646 depiction uh, of an estate uh, that is coming into utilization. Uh, it's actually already been quote unquote improved. Uh, that is the trees have been cleared um, so that there's room to start actually producing crops. Um, and to the point where it is a valuable piece of property that's being purchased. This is actually represents the purchasing of that land um, by a, a Captain Thomas Middleton, um, again in 1646. But you can see, um, you know, it, there's a lot of um, sort of empty space here, which uh, I would argue is, is representative of other estates. Um, or as you were, to, if you were to push further, um, if you were to push further northeast, looking at that compass rose for a second. For, uh, orientation, uh, you'd find you working your way into wooded areas. Um, but this is part of the, the process. This is, a, this is what we understand about, and you know, it's important to note that this is happening right on the edge of the water, because um, one of the things that you want to be able to do is you're producing your commodity is to um, move it most efficiently and most efficient movement uh, of bulk goods um, as sugar is becoming uh, is via water. But as we move ahead here. Um, so now we're looking at uh, an image of, um, of Barbados as a whole. Um, notice that it's turned on its side um, so that north is, uh, is to the right here. Uh, but what this image depicts is the way in which the island has been transformed. This is 1676. Uh, that we're looking at here. So getting closer to the end of the 17th century, but still well within it, um, not too far away from, you know, initial settlement uh, and that transformation toward uh, sugar production. But the, the island is becoming more and more heavily utilized uh, as we move ahead in time. And what I have in here is a slight close up um, where, and let's see if I can make this happen. The cursor seems in and in and out quite a bit. Um, what you can see here uh, is some depiction of crops, um, what's being grown in particular areas. Um, but of, of particular interest to me are the representations of um, of windmills, right? Of that utilization of wind. Um, to be grinding that sugarcane, um, getting that juice out of the sugarcane, and then that process of, uh, of converting it um, through the process of, uh, of using melting pots, heating it up um, that liquid, and eventually getting to the point where you have your refined sugar. Um, but the mills are all over the place um, as we look at this depiction. Um, so. Um, another way to uh, to look at and and uh, I'll be honest, I have this in here because it's one of my favorite uh, maps from from this period. Because this is Montserrat, um, and uh, Montserrat is uh, it's being depicted here in a way that uh, I'll describe as um, a series of recognition drawings that have been um, sort of put together to represent the topography of the island. Um, and there, there's more being represented than just the topography, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but this is really interesting way to be thinking about um, how it is that the um, that the colonies are are being utilized. Um, 
the importance of understanding what you're approaching from the sea is an integral part uh, of what's happening here. So uh, sailors, uh, mariners approaching Montserrat from <clears throat> a variety of, of cardinal directions would recognize the island um, based on how it's being depicted here as topography. Um, and then be able to navigate over to uh, to the appropriate side of the island. So it allows them to identify that it is indeed Montserrat, uh, and if that's if that's their destination, um, where they need to go to get around to um, to Plymouth, where uh, that agricultural production is happening. So the next image I have here. I'm oh, sorry. The next image I have here. Uh, it's a close up um, in the uh, sort of the bottom uh, right, uh, bottom, sorry, the top left-hand side. So I've inverted things a little bit here. Um, but you can see that it is a, uh, a series of plots of land uh, that have been divided up. And so the, the ways in which Montserrat uh, has been carved up uh, and claimed and quote unquote improved with a, a heavy focus on, um, on sugar production. Uh, to the degree that uh, the, and this, 1673 uh, is the, the year that this map was, uh, was drawn. And uh, some will analyze it will argue that the representation of multiple nationalities, European um, ethnic groups, uh, represents that there is a fair degree of, uh, of indentured servitude or um, uh, poor Europeans coming in and working the land. But they will be supplanted uh, not too long after this with enslaved uh, people of African descent who will come in and take over the work of the sugar plantation um, uh, and the white um, population that's left over, they will find themselves, to the poor white population, regulated about what they can do. Um, and they're actually being required uh, at this point to plant some food crops. Um, so this sort of gets to, to one of the, the factors that uh, is important to understand about the, the nature of the plantation complex. Um, and that is that, you know, all of this labor um, is focused on sugar. Uh, and so here we have uh, another depiction of Antigua. Um, it's focused on the production of sugar to the ex uh, exclusion, um, despite what this 1823 uh, illustration will indicate uh, with your little bit of livestock over here um, behind the, the fences. Uh, to the exclusion of all else, so that much of the uh, the needs of these islands um, are met by importation uh, of goods from tools to foodstuffs, um, so that uh, they become so focused on sugar production uh, that there is no time or energy devoted toward um, doing the things that are needed to sustain the population. And so uh, you will spend an awful lot of time uh, importing goods. Now, this is a good point to, to stop. And you know, while this is a, a focus on uh, the marine environmental history aspects of this uh, and the impact to the land and therefore the marine environment uh, on these islands, uh, it, it's impossible to talk about this without talking about the degree to which um, the, the degree to which the, um, the plantation complex is, uh, is making so much money, so profit oriented, um, and is able to make profits to the degree that uh, that the labor becomes expendable, um, so that these enslaved Africans, as they're brought in, um, will be entirely um, deemed entirely expendable. So that they will be worked as hard as uh, as possible for as long as possible, um, with limited amount of time to to recuperate, to recover from illness, um, to take account for uh, the grueling conditions of, of field work, as they are worked to death, they are replaced um, by other enslaved people of African descent that uh, will come across the Atlantic. So, so much money is being made um, that, yeah, you're, you're not focused on producing things that you need. You're not focused on um, and doing anything to, uh, to alleviate the circumstances of the laborers um, as they're working in the fields. Um, so these are things that are uh, really essential to understand about the plantation complex. Uh, as we move forward. And it's all about trade um, and making that trade as efficient and profitable as possible. So uh, here a prospect of a Bridgetown in Barbados from 1695. Um, you know, note the, the large number of ships um, 
in and around this inner harbor and um, this uh, outer area. Um, and also note the, the way in which the town itself has been built up with buildings um, tucked in side by side, uh, very little open space, warehouses, merchant houses, um, as well as the, the things that a port city would need to service um, uh, both the, the plantation backcountry uh, and their needs, um, but also to the service of transportation workers uh, that are going in and out here. Um, but this, in, in my mind, is an excellent example of the, um, the sort of degree to which uh, there is a sort of a, a hustle, get as much produced as possible, get it shipped over as quickly as possible, maximize that profit, um, in part because you're, you're dealing with a, a time period and a part of the world where um, you know, life is kind of short, uh, even for those that are not being worked to death in the fields. Uh, and the vicissitudes of, uh, of, of what it means to be connected to a, um, a colonial system, you don't have as much control as you would like uh, over your day-to-day -day lives. And so there is this sort of push to uh, utilize, extract as much as possible, as quickly as possible, um, maximize those profits, and then move on. Um, and so uh, I, I feel as though this image um, really kind of uh, en encapsulates that, um, that sort of economic side uh, to all of this. Uh, so yeah, so these are the things to, to sort of keep in mind. So we've uh, given you some images of, uh, of Barbados. Um, we've given you some images of Antigua. Um, we we'll probably used a couple more of those in this uh, slide presentation. Um, but now what I'd like to do is to um, sort of go back to uh, CCC. Uh, last time we checked in with folks, they were getting ready to join the ship. Well, uh, we did join the ship um, in, uh, in early February in, uh, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, spent a little bit of time looking at uh, that sort of different environment. Uh, Old San Juan is a fortified city designed to protect the movement of those valuable goods, that mineral wealth um, going in and out of uh, of the Caribbean Sea um, from ports in Central and South uh, South America. Uh, we didn't really spend time, even though that is a, a location where modern sugar production is happening, we didn't really spend time talking about um, sugar production there, but we left San Juan uh, on our way to Grenada, um, where uh, after eight days uh, of sailing and getting accustomed to, to life on board um, and putting to, uh, to good use all of those um, uh, all those skills that they, uh, our students have picked up during the short component. They're eventually going to make it to Grenada. And so now I'm going to use, um, some of the images of our, of our visits, uh, a mix of, uh, photographs, but also some artwork, um, to sort of talk about the, um, what I will uh, describe in the next slide as, uh, sort of sugar craze part one, um, as, uh, as I've emphasized already, this intense need to, um, utilize any land um, that you can find uh, to to grow sugar. Now, Grenada, um, on the face of it, you think, well, it's a medium-sized island. Uh, it's it's water rich, right? Plenty of fresh water, um, plenty of rainfall, um, but it's a steep-sided island. Um, there's a lot of terrain, uh, and so I've chosen both the photographs, but also this uh, this artwork. So the um, our our shipmates. Um, our student crew were tasked with doing recognition drawings um, for the ports that we stopped in. And I like these in particular uh, in postcard format, um, which I think was awesome. Um, I like these as they depict, um, you know, what is actually happening with, um, yeah, and depicts the, the nature of the terrain in Grenada. Uh, so there are some flat areas um, and they will be utilized. Grenada is one of those islands that trades hands between the French and the English. Um, and only after the French will slowly work their way in with lots of resistance from Native American groups in Colonago, um, who will use that uh, rough terrain um, and that wilderness uh, to uh, essentially resist the colonial endeavors of the French and then uh, the English for a while. Um, but here you can see this, this sort of terrain um, in Grenada. Our next port stop was um, a much smaller island in the Grenadines. Um, so this is uh, part of St. Vincent in the Grenadines. This is Bequay. Um, and Bequay is, uh, is a very small, uh, it's sort of steep sided to begin with. It doesn't elevate itself too much. It doesn't get a ton of rainfall. There is no ground water. Um, and initially, uh, Europeans looked at, uh, at Bequay as a, an island that was 
uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but they keep close to saying good for nothing. Um, as they passed, as they went from Grenada to St. Vincent, uh, they didn't bother to, to stop and think about um, the Grenadines or Beckway in particular uh, as a place that they could utilize. But with sugar being so profitable and with large um, land holdings taking over in, in some of the better areas to produce sugar, people did turn to uh, a place like Beckway with its limited freshwater resources and its thin topsoil uh, to grow sugar for, for some time. Um, and so it's the, sort of important to recognize that um, there are a variety of places where it seems unlikely that you would be producing sugar um, and turning a profit. And yet, uh, in its heyday in the, the first sugar craze, um, this is what was happening. Um, now, we jump from Beckway to, uh, to St. John in, uh, in our images here, in part because, um, yeah, the, the pandemic did intervene. Uh, we were supposed to make a stop in Dominica, and I was hoping to have recent images uh, and things to represent there. Um, we're going to have to rely on uh, information gathered from a, a fall trip to, to Dominica to sort of fill in blanks. But um, yeah, so we go from medium sized um, but steep sided with plenty of rain to uh, small and arid to small, arid, and steep sided. Um, as we can see in uh, here in St. John. So a um, couple of things to, to point out here. Um, first, this is uh, Corwith Kramer in the bottom left here. Um, this is in Francis Bay. Um, yes, I wanted a picture of the Kramer in here um, because I like putting pictures of the Kramer in where I can. Uh, but there's also, so you can see the steep sidedness here. Uh, and then the image here to the right, uh, this is at Annaberg Plantation. So it is uh, a curated, um, preserved um, sugar mill um, from uh, the, uh, the late 18th century and into the into the 19th century. Uh, so, despite the fact that we were in places where lots of sugar is being produced, um, this is uh, the first time that uh, with the students we're we're at a location um, where uh, we can see the the ruins of uh, of the sugar production process. Uh, and to think about what it meant, uh, and to look at the steep-sided uh, hillside, a uh, very steep hillside uh, that surrounds Annaberg, this mill, um, with I'm standing right in front of a of a wind-operated mill, um, to uh, you know, sort of uh, in the foreground, if you could see, it would be a a livestock mill when the wind wasn't blowing. Um, there's you know a place where the um, the sugar cane juice uh, is being melted in pots, heated up, melted, uh, and then uh, eventually produced and added a, a distillery at a later point in time. But they have all of these things, including uh, the ruins of slave quarters, uh, all of this is, is part of um, what you can see here. So uh, my point, my primary point in bringing St. John into this is to say that uh, it seems a really unlikely place um, to be producing sugar, yet with St. Thomas utilized, also very steep sided, um, fully utilized uh, the Danes, uh, and St. Thomas turned to St. John uh, and began cultivating uh, a significant amount of sugar there. All right, um, sugar craze part two. Um, so while it lasts, uh, it is a remarkably lucrative trade. Um, the plantation complex uh, shapes these um, islands predominantly in the Lesser Antilles, um, but it certainly shapes Jamaica and the Greater Antilles, um, technically the U.S. Um, what are now the U.S. Virgin Islands and the um, British Virgin Islands are in the greater until as well. It absolutely shapes life, but um, a series of factors, including the a, a, you know, bottom falls out of the sugar cane market, uh, competition with sugar produced from beet, um, um, from sugar beets, takes over. So the, the market bottoms out. Um, and this is happening right around the time in, uh, in one of the, uh, the books that's figure prominently in my virtual bookshelf was uh, uh, Eric Williams's book where he argues that part of the reason that, uh, that slavery uh, ended in the British colonies and uh, in the Caribbean is because uh, it was no longer lucrative and people were losing more money continuing to, um, to uh, employ enslaved uh, people of African descent and, and sugar mills. So, um, but Regardless of how it happens, um, the plantation complex um, collapses to the point where, yeah, there is emancipation um, in the early part of the 19th century. 
um, and it's right around the time that we see that um, that change. So, um, what happens with sugar? Um, what happens with sugar cane production? It comes back. Um, it comes back um, due to the uh, intense investment of predominantly business interests from the United States, and it comes back in the places that had been. Um, utilized in a very different way um, prior to um, prior to the the collapse of uh, of sugarcane and uh, and the lesser Antilles uh, and in Jamaica. So Dominican Republic, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, um, these are areas where U.S. investors will come in uh, and with an enormous amount of money uh, and a far more industrial mindset to production, um, will produce sugar on a large enough scale. Um, to make it possible to have it be profitable again. Um, so these places begin to ramp up sugar production, um, but then what happens with the rest of the Caribbean? Um, so let's let's go back to these places and let's uh, go back through the cruise track, um, if you will. So we're back here in Grenada, perhaps now most famously known for producing spices like nutmeg. Uh, they make some very delicious chocolate. Um, and uh, and they now depend, as many of these former plantation uh, complex islands will depend, on um, on tourism, right? Um, but what we have here is uh, with our uh, our guide that we use every time we go to Grenada, uh, Mandu Seals. Um, we're at a uh, a spice um, processing uh, area on an estate there, uh, down the bottom right hand corner. Yeah, there's uh, um, what used to be a traditional mill. There is uh, now rum being produced, sort of taking advantage of the association of sugar and rum in the Caribbean um, to produce uh, rum for sort of a, a niche market. Uh, but then uh, on the bottom left, right, the image of St. George's and the cruise ships there, right? This dependence or this, uh, this turn toward tourism as something that uh, the people are, uh, are interested in doing. In Beckway, Right, the uh, sugar comes and goes, uh, and then people are, are kind of abandoned uh, in many ways, uh, and they turn towards uh, um, the marine resources. Uh, they turn towards seafaring, uh, and then they have a, end up connecting up with New England whalers, uh, and they develop a tradition of whaling um, and bring that back. <laughs> excuse me, back to the island and make it part of their livelihood and their way of life. And so they are one of the few places that. Um, the IWC uh, grants um, indigenous whaling um, privileges too. Uh, so that's part of the culture. Here we are with uh, Herman Belmar, longtime collaborator with SEA. Um, but he is uh, talking to our students at their uh, at their maritime museum uh, there in Beckway. Um, but the connection to St. Vincent, regular ferry um, rides. It's a again Beckway's a small island, and right next to St. Vincent's is all kinds of um, people and goods. Um, being moved back and forth. Um, and the tourism that they're depending on, yes, cruise ships will go in and anchor and, and people will go ashore, but um, it's really a yacht tourism um, that people are depending on uh, in, uh, in Beckway more so than the cruise ship tourism. And then back to St. John, um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, it's part of the Virgin Islands uh, National Park. So it's a sort of curated, um, somewhat controlled uh, entry of, of tourism uh, into this environment. Um, so to keep an eye, I know we got started a little bit later, keeping an eye on the on the clock here and trying to wrap up here so that we have time for questions. Um, so what are the challenges for the former sugar islands? Um, in a nutshell, right? The the land that's been damaged by having all of that forest cleared, all that land devoted to sugar production, sugar extracting so uh, so much uh, of the nutrients out of the soil, um, leading to you know uh, as, as people move on from those areas, even during a period of massive sugar production, uh, and leave that land, uh, it's prone to, um, to erosion and, and runoff, uh, which has an impact, of course, on the marine environment. Um, as you're looking at doing continued agriculture, um, you know, you're looking at having to fertilize. And with that fertilizing, um, and again, with the, the lack of, uh, of vegetation sort of holding things down, uh, you have runoff that includes an uh, enormous amount of nutrients that are um, working their way into the coastal areas. Demographics, um, so we started out with Barbados and talking about the uh, enormous amount of labor that's required. So these islands are now uh, heavily populated, right? It's a dense population, it's becoming much more of an urban um, population um, from island to island. So dealing with a significant population in an island that's natural resources have already been um, 
significantly reduced. Um, and then, of course, there's the economic constraints uh, coming out of um, in the post-emancipation period, uh, still under colonial control. Uh, the economy is really faltering um, with starvation times for lots of people. There's some migration, a uh, different topic for a different day, um, that helps to a certain degree, but uh, people are really struggling. And then once independence comes in the 60s and 70s, um, those economic constraints really um, hamper development um, and certainly hamper the ability to diversify the economy um, as people are turning toward cash crops um, as that, that's the traditional way in which you earn money. Um, and then realizing the dependence on things like bananas um, is also uh, somewhat tenuous. All right, so then all together the environmental fallout. Um, what does this mean uh, for the island? Uh, you know, again, the islands are not able to support uh, the populations that are there to the degree that, uh, um, that uh, people would like. And the marine environment, uh, those of you that attended uh, Heather Page's uh, webinar would, would see sort of the impact on the reef environment, that impact on the reef environment as uh, the reefs become uh, less and less health, healthy and begin to degrade, um, then it starts to impact um, the ability of the islands to withstand increasing storm surges uh, and the, uh, the ravages uh, of climate change. Um, so uh, it's important to, to stop and note that uh, part of what we're looking at here in this program is not necessarily um, identifying problems and, and thinking about solutions, but learning about how people in the Caribbean are facing challenges, working around them, working together um, to find ways to recover from uh, what I would argue is you know, initially that devastation of the plantation complex. Um, so quickly through the British West, um, uh, the British West Indies, you have the West Indies Federation from 58 to 62, trying to pull those resources um, and, and take that economic, um, those economic limitations and try to work around them. Um, that uh, fades out and then um, a number of years later, the rise of the Caribbean Free Trade Association, CARIFTA, which then morphs into um, CARICOM or the Caribbean community. Um, and this is a cooperative effort to try and bring um, all of the shared resources to bear to get around um, and we, we maybe bring this up uh, if people have questions about it. There's competition between the islands uh, left over from sugar production um, where you're trying to get the best market possible for your sugar and try to produce the, the best sugar and the most valued sugar. So there's a, a lot of competition that um, historically exists and CARICOM is trying to work around that and also deal with the varying degrees of, uh, of wealth that exists um, in these independent island nations. And so CARICOM tries to um, address those as best it can. And now we're kind of back where we started. Um, and what I'd like to do here is to, to finish up with, um, with uh, this national resilience development strategy that, uh, that came out of um, the response to the devastation of Hurricane Maria uh, in Dominica. Um, so what I'd like to do is to just quickly read through the um, sort of the preamble um, that uh, Roosevelt Scarrett, the Prime Minister, uh, has written um, for this plan, uh, and it's just getting implemented. So um, you know, talking about the different aspects of it or the the ways in which it is starting to accomplish its goals, um, is uh, we're, we're a little too early in the process um, to to analyze it, but uh, I think it's a good example of. Um, exactly what I just referenced uh, before is that we're, we're learning um, from people that are facing some pretty daunting hurdles, um, how they can begin to get around those and set an example um, for other people in, uh, in dealing with, uh, with climate change. So uh, the National Resilience Development Strategy, um, Dominica 2030, um, is what the uh, Prime Minister uh, Skerritt had to say, on Monday, 18th of September, 2017, we were ravaged by Hurricane Maria, a strong category five hurricane, which wrought devastation on our beautiful country. This event resulted in significant damage and losses impacting 100% of our population in every sector of the economy. You have been made aware that Hurricane Maria resulted in 1.313 billion US dollars in damages and losses. Uh, equivalent to 226% of GDP. The recovery and reconstruction needs are valued uh, at 1.37 billion US dollars. Uh, in my address to the United Nations, four days after the passage of Hurricane Maria, I made 
a bold declaration that we were on the front line of climate change and that we had no options but to build the first climate resilient country of the world. That declaration is, a real, is as real today as it was the day it was made. Much has been done since, but you would agree that there is much to be done to make this a reality. It became imperative for this government to clearly define an action plan which would put into perspective the framework for rebuilding a climate resilient and sustainable Dominica. Much of the not, uh, national vision is uh, encapsulated in Agenda uh, 2030. My government is fully committed to the realization of that vision, but it's also a call to all our people at home and abroad to be engaged in this new resilience development frame. May this document become our resilience textbook utilized in the public and private sector, civil society and academia and referenced by development partners, friendly governments and other stakeholders upon whom we rely for a collective response to this mandate. Um, so yeah, this is, this is how we come back to and, and look at and, and begin to try and wrap our heads around um, what the impact of um, the sugar plantation complex was um, on uh, particularly the Lesser Antilles and how people are beginning to respond to that. So with that, um, sorry, we're went a little bit over an hour here um, with our somewhat late start, um, but I would love to take some questions from folks um, if you have those. Just let someone in out of the waiting room. Um, so for that person coming in, we've uh, reached the end of the presentation. Uh, I had lots of slides and plenty of things to say. Um, and I want to take some time to uh, take questions. All right, I see a hand up from uh, Allison. I think you can unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Um, thank you for a great presentation. I was wondering what your thoughts are on how we should move forward um, with helping the Caribbean in dealing with, you know, the climate crisis and um, if reparations should be issued or what, like what kinds of steps can we take as a country and then as um, supporters of people in those uh, countries that are suffering from climate change? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are a variety of ways. Um, you know, the, the first answer I would give is that, um, you know, the people of the Caribbean need to tell us what they would like. Um, and I think that's part of what Roosevelt Scared is doing um, with this initiative is, um, it's setting the bar pretty high. Say, look, this this is what we're prepared to do. Um, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that it is a daunting task that is ahead of us. Um, and any assistance that you want to provide towards those goals that we have set um, would absolutely be welcome. Um, it is worth noting that um, one of the things that uh, that's happening right now through CARICOM is that there is um, a process of seeking reparations um, from uh, from European nations, and that process of wanted to begin in 2014, um, and it is a, an ongoing process with uh, and you know from program to program every January, or actually every December, uh, I'll look again and see uh, what the news is. Um, but it is uh, since 2014 um, when folks decided to to go ahead with that. Uh, it, it's been in process since then um, without any clear indication of what's happening. And I would, I would imagine that um, for, you know, like all of us right now, um, the pandemic is, uh, is putting some things on hold. Um, but then post-pandemic, uh, you know, maybe some lessons learned from the pandemic will also, you know, allow people to think more openly um, and perhaps more generously uh, about the um, the needs of, of folks in the Caribbean as those folks are expressing those needs. 
Um, I see a question from uh, Carolyn Vincent. Um, have things changed much because of the, the hurricanes? Um, you know, it depends on where you're looking. Um, and again, it depends on, on who you ask. Uh, I would argue that the, um, the, uh, the political urgency, um, the uh, activism that's happening right now in Puerto Rico uh, is an excellent uh, example of, of people having to change mindset um, post hurricane. Um, you know, Dominica, um, this is, uh, and, and actually I would be happy to have either, uh, if they're still in this uh, meeting, either MJ or, uh, or Jeff Shaw, um, pipe in with, uh, with comments about their visit to Dominica in the fall. Um, you know, this, this seems like a very empowering moment um, for Dominicans. Um, and uh, I would say that, you know, that may be a product of uh, a sort of living through those that did live um, um, through the devastation uh, of Maria and Dominica, um, a, a new mindset, um, a new attitude. Uh, yes, um, uh, for uh, for Timothy Taylor, I would say yes, absolutely. So one of the things that my, actually my very first program I did with uh, with SCA, um, a CCC program, we spent some time in St. John, and one of the research projects was looking at um, sedimentation over coral reefs, uh, and you know that's the one of the immediate impacts uh, of the the runoffs is that you you get the um, the coral covered. With sediment, and therefore it, it cannot use uh, its uh, its ability to make energy from sunlight, uh, and it absolutely impacts the the health of of the coral. Uh, overfishing is certainly one of those, and so um, looking at, at coral reef environments as areas that have, are heavily utilized by fishers, um, you know that's a product of having to turn to those marine marine resources because uh, of a lack of other resources. Um, so that's one way, and perhaps less directly, uh, you can see the the impact of the um, the uh, overutilization uh, of the land, and then the the fertilizers and the fertilizers running off um, as uh, as people are are trying to make their um, agricultural production um, you know, all that much better. Uh, that's adding nutrients, uh, changing uh, the environment, um, you know, adding. Uh, uh, algal blooms, uh, and again, you know, interfering with uh, uh, the regular uh, ways in which coral uh, interact with their environment, particularly with uh, uh, with sunlight, in order to to produce. Uh, so there are a variety of ways in which it all happens to um, you know to have a, a significant impact on the marine environment, um, all coastal. Uh, and then, you know, what are, what are people doing about it? Uh, marine protected areas, CARICOM, um, you know, is encouraging those, uh, you know, fishing um, regulations and managing those fisheries across uh, borders, um, dealing with those straddling stocks. Uh, this is all part of uh, the process of recognizing that the marine environment um, is something that needs to uh, to be protected um, and that that protection is going to bring back um, vitality and biodiversity and that that is going to lead to um, uh, a greater uh, benefit to the island from everything from blocking uh, that storm surge uh, and, uh, and those seas uh, to providing um, uh, both a tourism environment as well as uh, a resource to pull out, um, extract uh, things of value like fish. I don't feel like I'm being overrun with questions here, um, but uh, I would absolutely encourage you and welcome uh, emails with questions. Um, learn more about uh, the program, learn more about the different things that we cover in the program. Um, 
and to uh, you know address any of those things. Uh, I know it's a uh, for those of you who arrived on time, it was a long time to sit um, and uh, and go through all of this. Uh, and I appreciate your attention and uh, look forward to hearing from you if you have questions for me. Um, thanks so much. So. Yeah, and then carry your minds, folks. Uh, if you haven't filled out the, the form, uh, um, please do so. This helps us to understand who's interested in our webinars, um, uh, maybe how to uh, cater to particular audiences uh, and to know who was attending. All right, thank you all very much. And uh, I will uh, look forward to hearing from you if you have additional questions by email, otherwise, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end this meeting.